very good to see everyone this morning. We're thankful for the presence of each and every person. This morning, I want to study for just a little while some things that the Apostle Paul writes about in his letter to the Philippians as he gives them some warnings about some people that they should avoid and the type of people that they should avoid being. And for our reading, we're going to read from Philippians 3, verses 17 through chapter 4, verse 1. And it says there, Brothers, join in imitating me, and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many of whom I have often told you, and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and they glory in their shame, with minds set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like His glorious body, by the power that enables Him even to subject all things to Himself. Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. I think every one of us would recognize and admit that as we try to live the Christian life, each and every one of us have struggles from time to time. As we do our best to serve Jesus our Lord, there are times that we fail. We have imperfections, we have mess-ups, and we have to correct things quite frequently in our lives. Despite our imperfections and failures, I hope that we can all say that our goal and our desire, what we are working towards, is to be as faithful to Jesus as we can be. And thus, even though we are imperfect, we consider ourselves to be followers of Christ. We consider ourselves to be the Lord's disciples, seeking to follow Him and learn from Him and imitate Him. Or at least, that's what we should be. That's what we want to be. But the question today that I want us to consider is, are we disciples of Jesus or are we enemies of the cross? Now, what a terrible thing to think about. What a terrible description to have applied to you to be labeled as an enemy of the cross. Now, I think Paul uses that terminology and it just drives home how awful it is to be opposed to the Lord. It's one thing to say that we're an enemy of Jesus. That is terrible enough. But to picture the Lord's own redemptive act, the the lengths to which He was willing to go to extend the Father's mercy and grace and redeem us from our sin, to put ourselves at enmity to that very concept, to be an enemy of the cross of Christ. In our song service this morning, several of the songs that we sang had to do with the sacrifice of Jesus and the blood that He shed for us and the sacrifice that offers us salvation. Now imagine being an enemy opposed to the Lord's work and the Lord's kingdom and the Lord Himself. Obviously, this must be a terrible individual to be an enemy of the cross. We might think of only the blackest of sinners and the most hard-hearted to be enemies of the cross of Christ. But when we look at the description that Paul uses to describe such people and such enemies, we may realize, frighteningly, that such enemies are more common than expected. In fact, we may even find that there are times that we ourselves prove to be at enmity with the Lord if we are not careful. Now, to consider the context of the passage in, in, this, in this great book of Philippians, in chapter 3, if you go all the way back to the beginning of chapter 3, Paul is exhorting the Philippian Christians throughout this entire chapter to live out their life joyfully in the Lord, to live out their faith rejoicing in the Lord always, is one of the things that Paul says in, earlier in the chapter. But as they live out their life joyfully, they need to be cautious. And they need to be warned against influences and ideas that could detract them from the pure gospel of Christ. Paul warns them against evildoers, and the people that he describes earlier in the chapter appear to maybe be Judaizing teachers, people who were trying to bind aspects of the law of Moses, such as circumcision, on those who who were Christians. And we don't know from reading Philippians how far these Judaizing teachers may have permeated or what influence they may have had on the congregation. But from this letter and many of Paul's other letters, we know that they were a constant plague, it seems, in the first century church. These individuals that were trying to add to the Lord's word and Paul frequently had to uh, correct their false doctrine. But whether or not they had made inroads in Philippi doesn't matter. The threat 
of their false doctrine was very real. And so Paul calls the Philippians to perseverance of faith and he admonishes them to strain forward to what lies ahead and to press toward the goal of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And to help them, he says, for them to look to examples, to look to people who they can faithfully follow and imitate. And if they will do that, then they'll be on the right road. And they'll, instead of imitating these false teachers and these evildoers, he says, imitate people like myself, Paul. And that's not Paul bragging, but as Paul would say to the Corinthians, imitate me as I imitate Christ. And he would also say to follow other godly examples who had proven to faithfully serve Jesus. But again, Paul warns about the dangerous influences of those who might appear to be godly, but in reality, they are enemies of the Lord. And Paul describes these enemies, and this description, I think, serves a twofold purpose. First of all, such descriptions help us identify those who are not truly serving Jesus, and thus should not be followed. If we see in someone that we respect and we're following these traits, and I know we have to be careful about being judgmental, we should be gracious and merciful, we should recognize even with our leaders and with those around us that they too are human and they are striving to grow and to learn. But then there are times when you can look at people and you can see that they are not the Lord's servants. There are times that we can see when people are enemies of the cross. That's why in many places throughout the New Testament, and we'll refer to some of them throughout the lesson this morning, Paul writes to different Christians and describes certain types of people and says, avoid them. Because they are not servants of the Lord, they may have an appearance of godliness, but they are enemies of the cross. And if we followed their example, if we followed their teachings, we will be enemies of the cross. And so we always need to be judicious. We always need to be discerning. And it's not that we're looking to our elders or our teachers or the preacher or other people in our lives just always expecting to find something, just always putting people under a microscope. But we should be wary. And when we see these traits, we should take note. But I think even before we look to others, I think that this description also ca should cause us to look inward. And make sure that we don't fit the description of an enemy of the cross. We certainly don't want to follow those who are enemies of the cross. But we definitely don't want to be an enemy of the cross. And so in these descriptions, what can we learn about these people? What makes a person an enemy of the cross of Christ? Well, the first description that Paul gives is he says that their God is their belly. Now that's kind of a strange sounding phrase. But true servants of the Lord are willing to sacrifice. Those who are truly following the Lord and they are his servants and they are faithful citizens in his kingdom, they are willing to serve him. And that even means they're willing to suffer for the sake of Christ. Just earlier in this chapter, Paul had said in verses 7 and 8, But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. For Paul, following Jesus was definitely a sacrifice. This was a man who was seemingly very respected amongst his Jewish peers. He was a man who was going places and he is a man who had already accomplished much. And he considered those things as rubbish, as dung, things to be thrown out when he learned the truth of who Jesus was and who he should be in relation to Jesus. He threw away prestige and power, probably riches, so that he could follow Jesus. We know from other places that may have been some of the lightest of his sacrifices. He was willing to be mocked. He was willing to be chased from town to town. He was willing to be persecuted and imprisoned and beaten. He suffered much for the sake of Christ. However, there are many people who are simply unwilling to sacrifice, definitely unwilling to suffer. Many people will follow the Lord, and they will even consider themselves to be serving the Lord so long as no discomfort comes to their lives, so long as the Lord blesses them. For many people, the accusation that Satan gave against Job may be very real. 
He fears you because you've placed a hedge around him. Many people fear the Lord, or so to speak, or think they do, until trials hit. And some people simply prefer pleasure and comfort much more than service and sacrifice. And in the end, their love of pleasure leads them into idolatry. That's the language that Paul uses. He uses language that points to idolatry. He says that their God is their belly. Now, it's not that these people are worshiping their belly. That's obvious. But what Paul is saying is their appetites, their cravings, their desires are what they are truly devoted to. Their wants and their satisfaction is what comes first in their life. And whatever comes first in your life and in my life, that is our God. These people may not bow down to statues. They may not worship false and imagined gods. But the greatest devotion of their life is their pleasure, their comfort, and their well-being. And thus their desires are an idol. As we look at modern society, it's quite clear that we as a society have fallen to the false god of pleasure and comfort. That is one of the highest goods in our country. To have as much fun as you can, to enjoy as much pleasure as possible. But you know, while that's true in 21st century America, it's not a modern problem. It's not something that has just arisen uh, since the 18 or 1900s or the 2000s. It's been around for a long time. Paul warned of such people in Romans 16, verse 17 and 18. He said to the Roman Christians, I appeal to you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you have been taught and avoid them. For such persons do not serve our Lord Christ, but their own appetites. And by smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the hearts of the naive. Now, we may think of these things, when we think of enemies of the cross of Christ, when we think of people that serve their own appetites instead of serving the Lord, it's easy for us to start thinking about the world. It's easy for us to start thinking about people out there, so to speak. But Paul's warning Christians about these people. He's not saying, watch out for the Roman people that are so evil and vile. He's saying, you watch out amongst your own number for people that serve their own appetites instead of the cross of Christ. Because sometimes, even in the church, these types of people come along. Sometimes we may allow ourselves to devolve into such people if we are not careful. This is one of the reasons why false doctrine comes up. Now, I've, we may all wonder, why would someone teach false doctrine? There's a lot of reasons. I like to think that most of the time it's simply because of ignorance, because Someone, or maybe if we have ever taught false doctrines because we just didn't understand something. And then when we learn better, we stop. But you know, that's not the only reason people teach false doctrine. There are people that stir up strife and teach falsehood because they have their own goals. They have their own desires that they serve. Maybe it's that they see religion as a means of gain. Perhaps they're the type of people that just desire power and control. Maybe they simply thrive on division and drama. There are such people. But whatever the specific cause or causes, and whether those causes are malicious or whether they are just simply misguided, the ultimate problem is often that they have enthroned themselves upon their heart, not Jesus. Paul gave a similar warning to Timothy. And he warned of those people in the last days, which they were in then and we are still in now. But he warned of people that would be lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. I don't know that there's a much more apt description of much of our society. And when I say society, I say that so that we realize we are surrounded by this idea and we are always more influenced by those things that surround us than we care to admit. And we live in a world that is saturated in a love of pleasure over a love of God. But Paul warned these people that these people have an appearance of godliness, is what he says to Timothy. There are people that appear godly. There are people that on the surface look like good people. Just like he warned in, in to the Romans, they may sound good. They may be able to flatter us and use smooth speech and they have an appearance of godliness. But when we really get to know them and when we really see their motivations, we may find 
that it is only an appearance. And their true God is their belly, their appetites, their desires. Or maybe if we look closely, we find ourselves to be that way. Now it may be difficult to spot these people since they have this appearance. So we must grow in the word. We must grow in an ability to discern truth from error. But we must also learn to discern who truly rules our hearts. I highly doubt that any one of us here today would just readily admit, oh yeah, I've enthroned myself. I view myself as Lord of my life, not Jesus. We would all, I'm sure, say, yes, Jesus is king. Jesus is the Lord of my life. But before we make such declarations, before we are sure that it's not our own appetites that are in control, maybe we should reflect on some of the choices that we make. Now, what do we do for the Lord's kingdom? How do we use our talents for the Lord's church and his people? Do we use our talents and abilities for the Lord's church and his people? Or do our efforts and our abilities simply go into making our life better, getting the next promotion, enjoying our own time? How do we use our abilities? Do we obey the Lord? Or do we choose sin because we want to feed our appetites, whatever those might be? How do we use our time? Do we make time for reading and studying scripture? Do we make time to pray? Do we spend time serving others? Do we spend time with the church? Do we make sure to spend time assembling with the saints? Or more often than not, do we find that we can't do these things because, as the common excuse goes, we don't have time? Now, I don't think I have ever met someone who told me that they had called into work and told their boss they couldn't come in that day because they were too busy. Have you ever skipped work because you were too busy to make it in that day? I doubt it. I've never known someone that made vacation plans and booked the the reservations and booked the plane tickets and when the time got there they realized they just had too much on their plate they were too busy there's too much else going on and so they just canceled the vacation we don't do that we don't tell coaches and teachers that our children can't make it to class or we're not going to make the ball game because we're just strapped for time and we've got so much else going on do we miss services because we're too busy? Do we miss services because we've got that vacation planned? Do we miss spending time with Christians because our busy week is just so hectic? Do we miss out on Bible studies or cancel on such things because we have so many other things going on? Who's the Lord? Who's controlling the decisions that we make? Is it the Lord or our own desires? What about our finances? Do we give to the Lord first? Or do we simply give some token offering to appease our conscience? Do we spend all of our money on what we have to pay and then what we want to buy? And then if there's some left over, maybe we'll give a little bit of that to the Lord. Who is the Lord? Our appetites or Jesus? we look at our life and the decisions that we make and we see that it's actually our desires we see it's actually our appetites and our perceived needs that take precedence and that guide our lives this may be a frightening message but what that means is we may very well find ourselves at enmity with the cross of Christ but Paul goes on to give another description of those who are enemies of the cross, he says they glory in their shame. Now sin is shameful, and sinful behavior should make us feel ashamed. But when a person persists in sin, something happens. The shame ultimately wears off. As the shame wears off, one begins to grow at least marginally comfortable, a little bit more tolerant. 
They continue down this road a bit further, and sin is not only tolerated, but grows to the point of just open acceptance. And sometimes it grows to even flamboyance and pride. And when this happens, I don't think what Paul is saying is that people flaunt their shame. What he's saying is people don't even see it as shameful. They're happy, they're open, they glory in this behavior, not even recognizing how shameful and awful it really is. They no longer view sin as something of shame. And instead of pursuing holiness, they revel in their sin. And they may feel no shame, but Paul says their glory is shameful. Now, this is one of those things that's very easy to spot in the world. There's a lot of ways in which we can look at modern society and see that the people around us glory in their shame. Here in just a little over a month, our country is going to have an entire month that's dedicated as Pride Month to celebrate and honor immorality. In the abortion debate, while there are some people that try and come up with arguments, there are those who proudly broadcast their participation in. I remember one of the taglines not long ago, and this may still go around, of uh, abortion advocates was shout your abortion that encouraged women to openly and excitedly tell other people about abortions that they had as if it was something to be proud of. I saw a talk show host sometime recently talking about abortion and he was actually kind of criticizing the left because they tried to say that abortion wasn't murder and he said it is murder. It is a type of murder. It's just one that I'm okay with. Those were his words. They glory in their shame. People boast of their ability to drink alcohol. They proudly display their lewdness and in dozens of other ways. Worldly people glory in their shame. And it's really easy to stand up and give sermons about how bad that is. And we can all shake our heads in disgust. But the truth is that shouldn't be surprising. Because citizens in the kingdom of darkness are going to do dark things. Our job is to be a light and to illuminate those things. And to make sure that we don't do the same ourselves. But remember who Paul is talking about. Paul's not warning the Philippians about those grotesque Roman pagans who glory in their shame. He's speaking of people who have an appearance of godliness and do so. Even though our citizenship is in heaven... There may be times that we act like citizens of the world. And when this happens, we need to repent and we need to change. And when we see the behavior in our brother or sister, such behavior as is fitting of the world, we need to rebuke them and warn them. Now, there's a right way to do this. There's a loving way to do this. But it needs to be done so that they can repent instead of persisting in their life of sin. Sadly, there are many times that instead of repenting, people choose persistence. Maybe we find a way to justify it in our mind, to make it sound not quite as bad as it is. Maybe we look at others and see their faults and say, well, my sin isn't quite as bad as theirs, and so I'll just keep on doing this. Maybe we've simply dulled our conscience and hardened our hearts. But even in the church, there are those who choose sin and remain in it. And when we do this, we fit the description of glorying in our shame. And we become enemies of the Savior. We need to carefully reflect on our lives and ensure that there is no sin that we have grown comfortable with. Now this is another spot of reflection. Look at your life. I need to look at mine. Are there behaviors that we take part in today that would have shamed us in the past? Are there ways that we speak or ways that we dress or things that we do that once we wouldn't have thought of doing, things that would have embarrassed, but now we have no problem with. Now, maybe we had a wrong view of something, and we learned better. Or maybe we've allowed some sin to take hold, and we've hardened our heart, and begun to glory in our shame. We need to have careful reflection. But also we need to ensure not only that we don't glory in our shame, but we must be careful to keep our congregation from devolving into such a state. 1 Corinthians 
5, verse 1 and 2, Paul said to the Corinthian Christians, It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and of a kind that is not tolerated even among the pagans, for a man has his father's wife, and you are arrogant. Ought you not rather to mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. Paul could have said just as easily, instead of you are arrogant, you glory in your shame. The Corinthians had a situation, and this wasn't just some mistake. This wasn't just some individual that was struggling. This was a flagrant, obvious case of sexual immorality. It was bad enough that even the world would have looked at this in distaste. And yet, instead of rebuking this brother, instead of condemning his actions, they tolerated it, and they allowed it, and they even seemed proud of it. Now, that fits 21st century American culture perfectly. Don't rebuke sin. Don't condemn evil behavior. In fact, don't even just turn the other eye. Accept it. Welcome it with open arms. Be tolerant. Glory and shame. Willfully participating in sin is shameful. But permitting and tolerating flagrant sinful behavior among the Lord's people is also shameful. Now there may be reasons that we want to ignore sin. Maybe we think that that's merciful. Perhaps we're afraid of someone leaving because if we rebuke them, they may get upset and they may leave. Maybe it's some other reason. But when we see flagrant and obvious sin among God's people and we do nothing, we are promoting sin among the Lord's people. We are bringing glory to shame, and we are opposing the Lord and His kingdom. Now, perhaps those who idolize pleasure, those who glory in their shame, you know, those may seem like extreme examples. It may seem like these types of people are easy to spot. We may feel fairly confident that we fit in neither of these categories, and I certainly hope that we don't. But what of Paul's third description of the Lord's enemies? No, this final description doesn't depict people who are in open rebellion, who are in willful idolatry, who are just hard-hearted rebels. It simply points to the person whose eyes have been drawn down to the immediate and the present instead of being lifted to the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. The most dangerous enemies are the ones that are unseen. The ones that can fly under the radar. The ones that don't stand out. And this is certainly in that category. This is perhaps the most pervasive and yet most difficult to guard against. Because it is hard to not set our minds on earthly things. We are physical beings. We are earthly beings. We have physical senses. We have physical needs. The world and its ways are here. They are all around us. They are visible. They are present. And then on top of that, earthly things are not always bad. We want to be healthy. There's nothing wrong with wanting to be healthy. We don't want to suffer pain. That's pretty natural. We have to eat food. We have to drink water. We need to provide for ourselves. We need to provide for our families. These are all earthly physical things. But there is a right way and a godly way of handling such things, and there is the worldly way. And the key is, what comes first? What are we truly focused on? In Matthew chapter 6, this portion of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says in verse 25, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Those are, let's be honest, those are difficult words for us to even deal with because most of us don't worry about these things anyway. Because most of us live in such abundance that we're not worried about whether we'll be clothed. We'll be, we're more worried about whether we have enough clothes for every day of the week. We're not worried about whether we will eat or drink. We're worried about how many times we will eat or drink. And so this passage may not hit home quite as hard as it probably did to Jesus' original audience. 
But when you're talking to people who are impoverished, when you're talking to people who are wearing rags or barely better, when you're talking to people who don't eat three meals a day, and you say to them, don't worry about food and don't worry about clothing, that's a pretty intense message. And it should be for us too. Don't worry about the earthly things. The Lord knows we need them. The Lord knows what his people require. So what's the answer? Verse 31, Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after these things, the world seeks after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Seek first. Remember what I said, whatever we put first, that is our God. Put God first, be devoted to God, serve God above all else. Christ calls us to care for our homes. He calls us to provide for our families. He calls us to be good husbands and wives, good parents, good children. The Lord commands that we be hardworking and ethical, performing our work with honesty and integrity. But He calls us to do all of those things because we serve Him, because we follow Him, not in place of following Him. Now this is one of the great paradoxes or ironies. When we are better Christians, we will be better employees or better employers. When we are better Christians, we will be better spouses. When we are better Christians, we will be better neighbors. When we are better Christians, we will be better at every other aspect of life. And yet what we so often do is we seek to be the better employee or the better spouse or the better neighbor or better in finances or better here, better there by placing those things before the Lord. And maybe we do get better at those things, but we do so at the sake and with the cost of our soul. Don't focus on those things. Put the Lord first. Too often we focus on earthly responsibilities and cares more than our commitment to Christ. And instead of letting our commitment to Christ guide us, we let those responsibilities and cares control us. Too often we become like the thorny soil of Jesus' parable of the sower. We hear the Lord's word. We want to follow it. But ultimately, the cares of the world or the deceitfulness of riches choke out God's word in our lives and strangle us of our faithfulness. Now, we all need to reflect again. What is our focus? What are your plans and your goals? I don't know what your daily or weekly or monthly routine looks like, but I think most of us, whether we write it down or think about it, have in some way, we have a plan. We have things that we want to accomplish, maybe for the year, maybe just for today, maybe for this week. We look at this week and we say, okay, I've got to get some things done. I've got to mow the yard. I've got to pay the bills. I've got to do all these things. And we have these goals and we have these things we need to do. But ask yourself, as you have sat maybe last night or today or will later today, and think about what you're going to do this week. How much of that plan will be about your faith. Will you make any plans to grow in your faithfulness this week? Will you make any plans to serve the Lord in His kingdom? Or will we simply set earthly goals? Are we more concerned with getting in shape, finishing the education, getting the next promotion, or some other secular goal. Those are all fine goals. Those are all good things to be a part of. But they must be secondary to serving Jesus. Again, following Jesus should shape everything else we do. Is that true? Or does following Jesus just get fit into our busy schedules when we find some time? Are our minds set on heavenly things or earthly things? That is an incredibly important question because the answer will reveal whether or not we are on the Lord's side or if we are an enemy of the cross. 
So we all have a choice. We all have something to think about. Which side am I on? You know, right now, this very moment, every single one of us in this building is on a side. We are either serving the Lord or we are his enemies. There is no in between. There is no neutral party. We are his or we are his enemies. Now, either way, according to Paul's passage, the future holds significant change for us. The question is, what will that, cha- that change be? Now, Paul does not mince words about the fate of those who are the enemies of the cross. He states plainly, before those three descriptions, he says their end is destruction. Satan would have you believe that you are the master of your fate, that you are best equipped to find fulfillment. You are best equipped to find happiness. And the world has bought Satan's lies wholesale. All around us are those who serve their desires, who glory in their shame and focus on this world with all of its cares and distractions. But whatever pleasure sin might bring, it ultimately leads to destruction. Since pleasure will condemn us to torment, to glory and shame will cast us from the Lord's glory for all eternity. To set our mind on earthly things is to miss out on heavenly things. For those who are the Lord's enemy, there is only one road to walk, the road that leads to damnation and destruction. But those who choose instead to be faithful citizens, those who enthrone the Lord and serve Him faithfully, now there's a great change coming for them as well. But that change will not be one of destruction. It will be one of glorious transformation. Paul offers these encouraging words to help us stay faithful. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like His glorious body by the power that enables Him even to subject all things to Himself. One day, Everything's going to be fixed. All things are going to be reconciled. All things are going to be subjected to Jesus. And when he does that, that will include the destruction and eternal condemnation of his enemies. But at that same time, he will glorify his faithful servants. He will resurrect them and he will transform them and he will change our lowly, earthly, mortal bodies into something fit for eternal life with Him. And knowing that, Paul gives this exhortation in chapter 4, verse 1, Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm thus in the Lord my beloved. One of Satan's greatest tools is distraction. And there are so many distractions around us. And the truth is, We don't like to suffer. But following the Lord will sometimes mean traveling a road of sacrifice and even a road of suffering. But hold fast. Even still, stand firm and cling to the Lord and His Word. Deny the world and all of its allure and its distractions. And simply keep your eyes toward heaven, pressing on toward the goal of eternity. Do not allow yourself to become an enemy of the cross. Remain steadfast and place your hope in the Lord. One final verse, James says it this way, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. So there's our choice. Destruction and the crown of life with our Savior and eternal life itself. Which one will we choose? What will you choose? What have you chosen so far? I said, which side are you on? Are are you a faithful servant of Jesus? That doesn't mean that we're perfect. Like I said at the very beginning, to be a faithful servant of Jesus still means that we're imperfect and we're flawed, but we're trying. We're faithfully striving to learn more, to do more, to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord always. Is that you, or are you an enemy of the cross?